Um, let's see. Uh, get some uh, type in the chat for me. Let me know how you guys are doing this fine Friday morning. Uh, nice and cold. Friday morning after our brief heat wave from a couple days ago. Um, okay, so are we doing okay? Come on, let's type. Wake up. Hopefully you guys can hear me okay and that's all good. Okay, excellent. Um, all right, so I'm doing great. Um, wish uh, wish I could have gotten more sleep last night, but you know, c'est la vie. Uh, fortunately, it's Friday, and um, uh, that means that it's the weekend, and I can relax a little bit. Uh, all right, so I wanted to start by correcting a most grievous of errors on my part. Um, so I've got the iPad loaded, and um, I uh, I wanted to remind ourselves of the predator prey system uh, model, which was uh, let me pick a new color here, which was this set of equations, um, and um, so um, so basically I was a big dum dum. And uh, the, this set of equations is correct. Um, one minor edit I made was that I rewrote the second equation um, basically to deal with my OCD. So uh, gamma comes before delta in the Greek alphabet, and so I wrote it that way instead of the other way. Um, okay, so, uh, but I figured out why it didn't graph properly when we were on Mathematica. So, uh, anyway, to, to, to recap the, the setup of the equations, so dx dt, x is going to represent our predator, or sorry, our prey, and uh, y is going to represent our predators. And the two assumptions that we made was that um, if there are no predators, then the prey would grow exponentially. If there are no prey, then the predators would die off exponentially. And that if there are predators and prey, then prey will die by, also die, or sorry, will only die by means of being eaten by predators. And prey, or sorry, yeah, prey will only die by being eaten predators will only uh, grow by eating prey. Um, okay, so it's not a perfect model, but you know, it, it will do, do stuff. Um, so anyway, so those were the equations. Uh, and let's go to Mathematica, uh, where, oops, sorry. thought I had Mathematica open already. Um, so I realized why we were getting uh, complete garbage and it's because I'm a big dum-dum. So right there where my mouse cursor is, right here, I had a plus. And so what that meant was that the prey population only ever grew. It never could decline because nothing there had a minus sign on it. Um, so that was, uh, that was silly of me. Uh, so let's fix it and put the minus where it's supposed to be. And then graph it, and everything works great. Um, okay, so I picked here uh, constants 1, 1, 1, and 0.5. And, and I'll talk about these constants more here in a second. But uh, let's plot everything. And the other, the other assumption that I made here is that uh, we start with 0.1 predators and 1 prey. Um, if, uh, so you could interpret the 0.1 to being... I'm going to um, consider these in units of a thousand or something like that. So uh, so it's okay to talk about 0.1 of a predator. It's just 0.1 unit, whatever the unit uh, I choose is. And it, uh, it it's also okay because the relationship between, let's say that I have 100 predators and 1,000 prey 
ought to be basically similar if I have a thousand predators and 10,000 prey or whatever, right? It should all be proportional. Um, okay, so run the model and rather than the, the crazy graphs blowing up that we got last time, we get something that looks kind of like this. Um, so let me just uh, make sure that we're clear. Uh, I graph the predators here in red and the prey in blue, um, kind of arbitrarily. And uh, I'm thinking of these being in units of, of thousands or something like that. Uh, so here's kind of the curves that we get for it. So um, the red curve again represents the predator population and the blue curve represents the prey population. So what I'd like you guys to do for a second is to kind of think about this. Uh, how how do you interpret this graph? Okay, so what uh, what features of this graph do you guys notice? And if you would be so kind as to type in the uh, the chat uh, or hop on Discord and say it out loud. Um, so yeah, what what uh, what do you notice about this graph? Um, I graphed it here, by the way, uh, over a time scale of 20 time units. Um, and, uh, the, maybe we should interpret 20 as, or I mean, sorry, the, the time units as being weeks, um, roughly, uh, or months or something. Um, it, uh, um, for this example, I just sort of picked numbers coming out of nowhere. Um, but so let's just interpret it as whatever the time unit is. Uh, yeah. So what do you guys notice? What, uh, what seems interesting here? worth pointing out. I'm going to have to like get stream uh, stuff so I can program in the Jeopardy music. Okay. Yes, Ethan, their maxima are near each other, but they don't share the same X coordinate or I guess T coordinate in this case for their maxima. Okay. So the, the maxima are close, but not perfect. Um, so Ethan, in terms of the, the idea of this being a predator prey relationship, why does that make sense? Why does it make sense that the, um, so that Ethan's observation is that, like, here we uh, see the peak, uh, oh, and I'm sorry, let me scroll up a little bit so that you guys can see the entire x-axis or t-axis. Um, the, uh, why does it make sense that, say, the, pre the prey here have a maximum population occurring at, like, uh, two point something? And then the predators have that spike there. Yeah, more predators, less prey. Um, and 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 uh, Nate, the vice versa is important, right? So the way to one way to sort of interpret this is, if the prey have a maximum amount of population, then notice that at that moment in time is when the predator population starts to go up dramatically. And it makes sense. You've got to have prey. Uh, yeah, exactly, Ethan. You've got to have prey to eat uh, before you can, uh, before the predators can reproduce. And so when the prey number uh, hits its maximum, the predators basically are in feeding frenzy mode. And they start feeding frenzy. And notice that as the predator population is spiking, the prey population is plummeting. Okay, but then you hit this peak for the predators, and the prey are really low. So what's going to happen to the predators? Well, 
now there's not enough things for everybody to eat so they're going to start to die off and as they start to die off they're not predating or predating the um the prey as much and so the prey population is going to start to go up and then uh the whole thing is going to sort of start repeating itself um so uh yeah um also does it make sense that uh at least with the the model that we have the uh the fact that we see sort of a repeating behavior of these spikes and then troughs and then spikes and troughs or maybe you could call it like booms and busts does it make sense that it's uh, sort of a cyclic uh cyclic pattern Hopefully that makes sense why it's cyclic or that it ought to be cyclic. Um, yeah. Man, you guys are almost as with it here as you were in the classroom at 8 in the morning. Um, all right. Well, um, yeah, hopefully it makes sense. Um, really, the reason that, that it makes sense that it's cyclic is because um, <clears throat> our system here is basically modeling the idea that uh, there can only be, um, there can only be um, predators and prey, and that's literally everything. So this doesn't take into account any other effects it's as if you have basically a giant field with only rabbits and foxes or whatever and the there's infinite food for the rabbits um, so we're not taking into account say seasonal changes to weather or uh, reproduction properties or um, maybe there's a species like say a rabbit where uh, multiple species are competing for that prey, so there might be foxes and wolves and something else that all eat the same thing, but that don't interact with each other in any way. Um, so, yeah, so the model is, uh, it is somewhat limited, but, uh, but it, you know, at least gives us a, a sense for things. And, um, one of the things when I was doing a little bit of reading, uh, uh to, to get ready for teaching you guys this stuff was um, found some historical data of uh, rabbit and fox fur trading uh, in terms of when there was a lot of uh, when there were a lot of fox furs versus rabbit furs being sold to the uh, to the Hudson Bay Company and it follows almost exactly this kind of looking pattern uh, which is really kind of cool so uh, I'll I'll share the link with, to that with uh, that I found uh, with you guys because I think it's just kind of interesting that you can, you know, go back and and historically uh, historically see this kind of thing. So anyway, um, okay. So um, let me um, uh, switch gears a moment and let's uh, let's talk about how we actually solve these systems. So. What I did here to actually solve it was I basically just um, I just cheated, for lack of a better way of putting it, and I used Mathematica's built-in numerical differential equation solver, um, and uh, and it works great, um, but that's kind of uh, just you know the equivalent of using your calculator without understand this, understanding necessarily what it's doing um, so you know it works for getting an answer so that we can analyze it but I want to really get into the to the weeds on how uh, we can solve this actually 
and how, how the calculus or the tools that we have under our belt uh, is enough to go through and solve this thing. Now, I should say in DSolve and Mathematica in general is a very sophisticated uh, program. Um, it has at its disposal a number of different computational techniques for solving uh, differential equations, and there are hundreds of these things. Um, the only one that we have looked at so far is the Euler method, which is sort of, in a sense, the most primitive uh, way that you can do, do it. Um, so when it spits out solutions, and then we graph them sort of like this, uh, they may or may not be coming from an Euler type method. It may be coming from one of the more sophisticated type methods. So what I wanted to do was talk about how do we adapt our Euler's method from before uh, to this system, uh, or rather now because we have a system of differential equations, meaning it's two differential equations that are related together, how do we adapt the Euler method to that and actually manually program this stuff in? Um, okay, so in order to do that, um, we'll, uh, um, I'll look back at um, the, um, sorry, uh, we'll look back at the, um, uh, the Euler's method stuff that we defined before, and uh, then we'll kind of adapt it, um, adapt it to our, um, the fact that we have a system. So, uh, so let me go back to um, this document, which was uh, how we were doing the Euler method. And this was for a single differential equation. Okay, so here's how we did it. We defined a function. Okay, this would be basically the right-hand side of the differential equation. And then we basically made a list and appended items to that list. And what did we append? Well, the first coordinate of each item is the t-coordinate, and the new t-coordinate is basically just the old t-coordinate plus our step size. And then the new y-coordinate is the old y-coordinate plus h times dy dx, basically, okay? And um, so that's what this bit was here, was h times the derivative. So uh, we basically, I'm going to copy and paste sort of this sort of idea. I, I, I won't literally copy and paste it, um, but this is basically the idea that we need to adapt, okay, um, to our uh, differential equation system. All right, so let me go back over to the predator-prey model, okay, and let's um, look at uh, what we've got there. Okay, so we need two um, we need two uh, lists basically of data. Okay, we need the predator list, or let me start with the prey list. And for the prey, I started with one unit of prey. Um, and so I'm going to call this preys and not prey because I've already used prey in setting up my differential equation. And uh, I don't want to reuse the same name for two different things. Okay, so I'll say that preys, uh, the, the starting value is, is 1. And then for the predators, I'll say that the starting value at time uh, 0 is 0.1 unit. Okay, so that would be basically programming in this part, which were our two initial values for how many predators we had and how many prey we had at the, at the, the beginning. Uh, like with the Euler method, I need a step size and... For just right this instance, let me make the step size equal to 1. 
um, and we'll we'll change that uh, later, uh, possibly. Um, the other thing I need to do is, for convenience, I need to define these two things as uh, so that thing, which is the right hand side of the prey equation, and this thing, which is the right hand side of the uh, predator equation. I need to make those functions so that I can plug things into them. And the way that I'll do this is I'll um, I'll make two functions. Okay, so f of x, y, t, and I'll define that to be a times x plus b times y times, or b times x times y, and I made the same mistake I made last time, which is that should have been a minus. Okay, and then I'll define another equation called g, uh, which I'll make the second thing, which is minus g times y plus d times uh, x times y. Okay, so those are my two, uh, these, this is d, the, the rate at which the, pri uh, the prey is changing. And the second one is the rate at which the predators are changing. Okay, so I've got those two things. Um, and uh, so let's uh, program that in. Okay. Uh, oh, and it looks like, oh, I see what I did. Um, yeah, uh, I can't use G because uh, I've already used G. So let me call this just say capital F and capital G, and that way I'm, I'm good. So the reason is I, I had used G as a constant, and so I can't reuse it as a function name. Uh, it, um, it can't be both things. Okay, um, there's one other thing I wanted to point out real quick, and so let me scroll down to the bottom and show you this, which is um, last time we were doing a bunch of things that looked like this data of one of one uh, but it turns out there's also a slightly more compact way to write it which is data of one comma one um, and so both of these things are equivalent what they're doing is they're saying okay I've got a list object called data the first object in it is this list and the first object within that list is the number zero. So last time we, uh, with the when we did the Euler method, we did everything like that with sort of the double pair of double brackets. And uh, but we could have written it this way, which is a lot more convenient and um, uh, a lot more compact than the first one. They're equivalent, so it doesn't really matter which one we use, but hopefully you guys agree that this one is a little bit cleaner uh, than, than the other one. Okay, so now we need to program in, program in we need to program in, in our Euler method. And uh, before we do that, let, let me go back to the other uh, Euler method one. And again, let's remind ourselves how we did this. So we did a for loop. And so I'll copy and paste that part. And then we'll make some tweaks to it. Okay. So uh, the first thing that we need to tweak is that we really are going to have two append statements. The first one is that we need to append things to the to the predators. And the second thing is that we need to append thing to the praise. Okay? So uh, because we have two functions or two populations, we need to do this business twice, okay? Once for the praise 
and the other time for the predators. Okay, now, what are we appending? Well, we're going to append to each of them an ordered pair. The first coordinate of that ordered pair needs to be the T coordinate, which is going to be praise of I comma one. Okay, so that's equivalent to this. The first coordinate, we're going to take the old first coordinate and we're going to add H to it. And we'll do the exact same thing for the predators like that. Okay, so that will uh, make our first coordinates of all of our data basically the t coordinates and right now because we started with t equals 0 and h equals 1 these first coordinates are just going to count up 0 1 2 3 4 and so on and then stop at um, uh, 100 um, and uh, that's that's it now for the t coordinate that makes sense that's correct the the one that's uh, where the money is, is on the uh, the other coordinate, the second coordinate. And that is going to be the old second coordinate, okay, for each of them, plus, okay, so the, the new second coordinate is the old second coordinate, plus however much things have changed. And how much have they changed? They've changed h times the function. So the first one changes based on the function f, and the second one changes by the function g. Okay. Um, and then here, we need to put in um, our function now, the function here, remember, takes in x, y, and t. So there's, we have to plug in three things to the function. x is the number of prey, okay, at that given time. And so we need to um, uh, plug into that, uh, let's see, this would be uh, x is the prey. So we need to do praise of i comma uh, two comma preds of i comma two okay comma the t coordinate oops and I'm sorry guys this should have been here. Um, that should have been T right there. That's my bad. Um, all right, so we're not finished here programming. And then the T coordinate, which was uh, preds or prey, it doesn't actually matter here, of I comma one. Okay, now that looks like a whole bunch of garbage because we got brackets going on all over the place, but let's just look at it. So there, what are we doing? We're plugging three things into the function f, and f is going to spit out a number. We need to plug in the number of predators, the number of prey, and the time. Okay, and the time I put last, in this case I could have omitted it entirely because the um, uh, the system is only dependent on x and y, or rather the predator and prey numbers, that there's no explicit dependence on time. But what do we have to plug in? We have to plug in f of the number of prey, the number of predators, and the current time. Okay? All right. So then, basically, all I have to do is take this and duplicate it here. But everywhere I see prey, I just need to replace it with the predators, uh, except here I don't replace it. Uh, 
except I'm going to replace function f with function g. And then this I can remove because it's no longer relevant. And then I'm going to run that, and it will take a minute to run, and hopefully won't crash on me. Running, running, running. Still running. Okay, it should have finished by now. Um, okay, let me let me save this and um, let me quit the kernel. Okay, so that means that I have to rerun everything. Um, all right, so first off, let me let me decrease this to twenty. Um, and rerun it. Okay, there we go. All right, so first thing that we're going to get is the plot like we had before. And then there's all this data stuff which I can delete. Um, so we've computed uh, basically prays and preds are our lists. And now all we need to do is graph those things. So let's do a list line plot of the praise and then another one of the predators and let's see what those line plots look like okay so we got that for the predators and this for the praise that's why the program took so long a minute ago because this is complete garbage and um, so let's go in and look at and make sure that I didn't jack something up here. Okay, I got the minus where it belonged. Um, That's why. Uh, no, that's correct. Because praise goes first, predators go second, and oh, I had these two backwards. I don't think it's really going to make much difference though, because the time coordinates were the same. Um, all right, let me go up here, and I'm going to hide that graph first, so that we can get to this thing. Um, so there's a couple possibilities uh, for what's messed up here. One is it's possible I'm being a big dum-dum. And, uh, but one thing we can do to kind of see is let's look at the first entry in the prey thing. So the first entry should be 0, 1. That makes sense, right? Let's look at the second entry and see what we're getting there. 1.9. Okay, so that seems reasonable. Um, okay, so I think what may be happening here is that uh, uh, that we actually have sort of the limitation of the Euler method. So let me um, let me go right here and let me decrease h to 0.1, and then I need to multiply by 10 my the number of times I'm going to do this. Okay, and there we get a graph. So, um, so actually nothing was wrong with our program. What was wrong was that we were using too big of a step size. Okay, we were using a step size that uh, was uh, too large to capture um, accurately the uh, the system that we had. Um, Okay, so the two plots now work. Everything's great. So let me come up here. Let's get rid of this, and let's um, let's put these two on the same graph. So I have already used P1 and P2. So let me use Q1 for this guy, Q2 for that guy, and um, let's put this one in blue like we did before. 
or no, pray. We what did we do uh, before? Uh, prey was in blue and predators were in red. Okay, so prey was in blue, predators in red, and then we can put these together on the same set of axes. Okay, and we get this thing here. Um, so what's happening there, right there, where that, that disconnect is, is if we graph them individually, um, the red one is spiking, and it's just getting chopped off on our graph. So it, uh, uh, what we would need to do is, let's on the red one, let's do plot range, say, 0 to 20, and then we'll do the same thing here. And what that does is it puts them on the same axes units. Okay, so then we can hide those two and get then there our final output. Okay, so uh, so there we go. Um, so now what I want to do is um, let me actually change these to um dashed okay so they're they're dashed lines instead of solid ones um and the reason i want to do that is let's go back up to our original graph which let me unhide it for a moment this is our original graph okay and so i'm going to make the same change to this one that i did i'm going to plot those from 0 to 20, okay, and we got that sort of pattern, but then by doing so, what I can do is I can combine these two together, and so um, I can show P1, P2, Q1, and Q2. Um, P1 and P2 are the fancy Mathematica uh, function solution, and Q1 and Q2 are our manual solutions. And what I wanted to kind of notice here, let me hide that one, is what do you notice? <clears throat> so um, what do you notice about um, the solution that our Euler's method got versus the solution that uh, the fancy fancy pants Mathematica solution is. So just a reminder, the dotted line, the dashed line, is our manual solution, and the, um, the solid lines are fancy pants mathematical solutions. So what do you guys notice here? Anybody? Bueller. Come on, Ethan. Surely you noticed something. Oh. Shout out to DJ Sancha. He's not even in this class. He's in my computer science class. But I guess he wants to learn some calculus, so... Yeah, all right. So leading up to time value of uh, six or so, they're pretty similar. Not perfect. Um, the heights of this peaks are slightly overdone with the um, uh, with our Euler method. Um, <clears throat> so the Euler method, you'll notice, is pretty good from the beginning. It's slightly off a little bit. But then it starts to get progressively worse, okay? And basically, that's what's happening with the Euler method, that it accumulates error over time. And uh, when we looked at the exponential uh, and logistic differential equations, uh, I guess this would have been Monday. Maybe it was Friday last week. I don't remember. Um, <clears throat> what we noticed 
was that um, it uh, it really almost spot on paralleled the exact solution. Okay, and what we're seeing here is that this system is much more sensitive to the choice of H than uh, than other simpler systems. So if your H is too big, you're going to get complete garbage. Uh, we started with H equals 1, and we got literal garbage. Here, for short time scales, like up until T equals 5, 6 or so, it actually looks pretty good. Things are pretty much spot on. It's, um, it's that as you keep going that the errors accumulate. All right, so let's make a minor tweak here. We already cut the step size down by a tenth a minute ago, so let's do it again. Let me make the step size now 0.01. That means that I need to do 2,000 uh, repetitions of my loop, okay? And let's see if that improves things any. Okay, so now what do you guys notice? Um, I reran it. All I did was I increased, or sorry, decreased the step size by a factor of 10, and I have to therefore increase the number of times I can recompute things by that same factor. And now look what we get. So what do you guys think about this one? Bueller. Yeah, so much better, but uh, after each peak, they start to get worse off, okay? So that actually has nothing to do with the fact that it's the peaks, as it does, uh, well, very little to do with the fact that it's peaks, and more to do with the fact that the time is just further down the line. So the Euler method, uh, we could decrease the step size yet again, um, we can make this 0 0.001 and repeat this loop 20,000 times, okay, and Mathematica will do it, okay, and if I do that, then uh, I get this, where uh, you basically can barely tell the difference, like it's only until right about here, roughly, that you can even see that there's a dashed line at all. Okay, so now if we were to do this in Excel, right, let's think about how much this would take. If we had done this in Excel, and each time I repeat my Euler method approximation, I need to use a new row, I would have to use 20,000 rows in Excel in order to get the accuracy that we did right here. So, do you want to use 20,000 rows in Excel? I mean, you could, but do you really want to drag a formula down to the 20,000th row? Probably not. Um, so, you know, I showed you guys how Excel could be kind of a handy tool to get cracking with this, but this is the point at which we re reach the limitation of it, that, um, you know, that, that in order to use Euler's method, let me be clear about that, in order to use Euler's method, you have to have a very small step sizes uh, in order to get any kind of decent accuracy long term. Now, uh, it depends on the differential equation that you're solving also. So, some differential equations uh, are less sensitive to uh, H than others, and this predator-prey model was pretty sensitive to it. Um, okay, so, um, right. All right, so hopefully this kind of makes some sense, and I need to post these uh, 
these files up onto uh, to Canvas so that you guys can look at them. Um, partly because, you know, this part of it here, the append to, um, we can adapt this to our SIR model for disease stuff. Um, and there what we would have is we need to have three things because in the SIR model you have three populations, susceptible, infected, recovered. Um, and so this stuff would be somewhat similar but would require a little bit of minor tweaking, nothing too substantial. Um, okay, well, uh, so I think uh, actually we're pretty good for today. Um, I think I'll, uh, we'll quit. And uh, I hope you guys have a good weekend. Uh, I'll post these files to Canvas. Um, also have um, kind of a question that I'd like to get y'all's opinions on. Um, so basically what I wanted to do was uh, for the class is um, forget the final. Like, let's just forget exams. It's stupid. There's no point anymore um, because we're all away and for you know forget it uh, and so what we're going to do instead is I'm going to have you guys do a project on uh, the SIR model stuff uh, disease propagation um, and so my question is would you guys be interested in doing those in pairs or individually um, and uh, if there's sort of a unanimous answer then great um, the, the reason I wanted to ask is because unlike when we're all together on campus, it's a little harder to get two of you guys together because basically you'd have to use Zoom or uh, text messaging or phone calls or whatever to, uh, to work together um, as opposed to uh, on campus where you could just get together in the library. Um, so uh, let me know what you guys think um, in the Discord uh, text chat um, about this idea of would you be interested in doing the project in pairs or uh, individually. Um, all right. Have a great weekend, guys, and I will see you guys on Monday.